Good morning, everybody. This is Brandon with Jarhead Diagnostics. Today, I want to just discuss with you the diagnostic process, <clears throat> why you need it, what it's for, and how you can go about developing your own. So stick with us and let's get into it. What is a diagnostic process? Well, the diagnostic process is just that it's a process that you need to follow anytime you have a vehicle that has any type of concern. You fall back on your process and you go step by step. What this does is it allows you to start building a pattern and that pattern will grow with you as a technician, but every time that you use your process, it simplifies things and makes sure that you stay on task. That way you don't get brought into one of those kind of rabbit hole situations where you're looking at something that you shouldn't. <clears throat> so you want to develop a process and stick to it. I'm going to kind of go over my process about what I do. Um, it's a fairly broad process and it can be used for just about anybody. So, you know, we'll kind of take it from there. All right, on my process, step one, uh, proper debrief of the concern. Uh, debrief is kind of a military term that I've always used. Anytime our pilots came back from flight and they had an issue, we would always debrief them with the issue. Um, but anytime you do this conversation, whenever you're learning what you have to figure out, you always ask questions, and this is step one in the process. During that debrief, you ask your questions. Always lead the questions and never give closed-ended questions. Always give open-ended questions. Because if you just lead with, okay, so your vehicle's hesitating, yes. And then they'll just respond with yes. And, you know, okay, now i got to figure out the vehicle hesitation. But if you lead with an open-ended question, you know, good morning, Billy Bob, how are you today? When does your vehicle hesitate? Then they'll kind of lead into open-ended questions and they'll answer it, but they will give you, a lot of times they'll give you the answer what you're looking for, but in a term that they might not realize that they're giving it to you. Well, you know, technician, I always have my hesitation whenever I'm going to my mom's house. Okay, Billy, well, what do you do when you go to your mom's house? Well, you know, you know that big hill over on that street? I always drive up that hill and during that up that hill, I always seem to have to pass a car. Well, whenever I'm passing a car going up the hill, that's whenever I notice my hesitation. So now as a technician, on just that simple question, when does it happen, you now figured out that the hesitation happens whenever you're going uphill under an extreme load. So now as a technician, whenever you go out to do your testing to verify the concern, you now know that you need to be going uphill and put the vehicle under load to try and get the hesitation. So always, 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 whenever you're doing your initial questioning, you always lead the question and you always give them open-ended questions. Never close in a question because all that will do is kind of lead you astray. So <clears throat> step number two, you always want to verify the concern. If you cannot verify the concern, you cannot properly diagnose the vehicle. I don't care what anybody tells you. If you cannot verify it, you cannot properly diagnose it. So always, always, always verify the concern. <clears throat> Step three, I always do a full health report on the vehicle. Um, this one's kind of up for debate. Some people say, well, in my process, I might only scan, you know, the PCM. Well, that's fine, but sometimes the PCM might not have information that, let's say, the TCM or the ABS module is saying that it's having issues communicating with this. Well, just because you scan the PCM, you might not have seen the other issues that are inside the vehicle that all kind of leads back to your diagnostics on or testing of what you need to be doing for that vehicle. So I always take this time and I always do a full system scan. On some vehicles, yes, this might take you an extra four or five minutes. <clears throat> I understand that. But if you're trying to do the proper diagnostic process, you need to know everything that's going on with that vehicle so that way you as the technician can figure out their issue and get their vehicle back to the customer. Step four, probably one of the largest ones, research. After you verify the concern and after you've done your full health report, research. You couldn't even understand how many times I have repaired a vehicle because of the research. I searched 
TSBs, service actions, recalls, concerns that have happened, and what it will typically do is help guide you in your diagnostic process. If you skip this research one, you could be spending hours diagnosing a vehicle that has a software concern where all you have to do is do a software update and the concern is gone. Or there is an upgraded bushing because you've got a squeaky noise. Prime example, whenever I worked at Kia, I actually helped develop a uh, service action for the soles because on the soles they had a solid rear axle. Well, going over a slight creak or a slight pivot, that rear axle would shift just enough for the bushing on the right hand side to create a squeak. We had so many different people trying to figure out where the squeak was coming from and how and so many parts were just thrown at it and then come to find out all we had to do was loosen the bolts, spray some of the lubricant into the bushings, tighten everything back up and it went away. So many parts were replaced because a TSB wasn't there. Now that TSB is there, there's no more parts to replace and you can take advantage of these. No more having to figure out, well, it's doing this. Do your research and somebody else might have already had that exact same issue that you have and it will help you in your diagnostic process as to what's the steps that you need to do. So always, always, always research. That research might take you five minutes or it could take you five but those five, 15 minutes, because <clears throat> Step five is your uh, diagnostic testing, or just your testing, depending on how you refer to it. Always, whenever you're doing your diagnostic, do funnel testing. I think Jim Morton kind of cued that funnel approach. You want to start very large, on like a wide range of items and then funnel down to the pinpoint testing. Um, a good example would be, let's just say you have a misfire. Well, a, a funnel approach would be, let's do a relative compression. And what that's gonna do is that could say, okay, my engine has good mechanical health. So now I don't really necessarily need to pinpoint test any mechanical issues. What I'll do is I'll actually now go pinpoint other items inside of the engine performance section that could cause a misfire. You're taking that system and you're literally splitting it in half with a two minute test. That's, that's huge because if not, then what are you gonna do? Well, now I need to do, let me do a compression test and a leak down test and this test, test my spark plugs, test this, test injectors, test all this other stuff, whenever all you had to do was a quick two minute test, relative compression, now it's okay, it's you know engine performance side or engine mechanical side. It helps you funnel down to that pinpoint testing. Which brings me to this, you have to get down to your pinpoint testing rather quickly. You don't wanna get on one of these rabbit chases where it's, you know, I think it might be this and then you spend four hours trying to diagnose something that has absolutely nothing to do with the concern. So always do the funnel approach. Start with a large testing platform and then work your way down to pinpoint testing of whatever that concern might be. <clears throat> All right, after the pinpoint testing, and let's, I'm just gonna use a converter, a catalytic converter. You diagnose that the vehicle needs a catalytic converter. After your pinpoint testing, you need to do a brief test on any of the systems that might affect that component from failing. Why is that big? A catalytic converter is a very expensive item to replace in the vehicle. They do go bad. You replace it, it comes back two weeks later needing a converter again. If you would have spent this time, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and done some other brief testing, you might know why that, that converter failed. That converter failed again. Let's say the vehicle's got a massive oil consumption issue. Well, that converter is now failing because it's got too much engine oil in the converter. And then two weeks later, boom, the next thing you know, it needs a converter again. Well, why? Well, it needs a converter again because it's consuming oil. Or does it have a faulty fuel injector and that's causing too much fuel to be dumped into the converter and burning the converter up? So after you get done with your testing and your pinpoint testing, always make sure that there is nothing else that could be causing that issue to happen. Another good example, a purge valve. 
let's say the vehicle's got a purge flow issue, you put a purge valve in it, and then it comes back a week later, it needs another purge valve, and you're like, well, what the heck's going on? Well, maybe the canister has failed, and it's allowing all of the charcoal pellets filtered all the way through the EVAP system, and those charcoal pellets are now stuck into the purge valve, causing it to stick open. So now you have to backpedal as a technician and be like, well, this part's also failed, and that's why that one failed. Whenever you did your initial diagnostic process, you should have already looked at all of those different things that could be causing that component to fail. So after you do your testing, always just verify that there is no other system or component that caused whatever component you found bad to be the one to fail. <clears throat> step number seven and the last step of the process is verify your repair. This is huge, especially in the industry where people look at us and think that we're just trying to rip them off. Always, always, always make sure that you're verifying, whether that's a coolant leak and all you do is you put a, your coolant pressure tester back on it and verifying that the coolant is not spraying out of anywhere anymore and taking it on a short test drive to make sure it doesn't overheat to running a EVAP service bay test and making sure that the EVAP system is working properly. Always redo or always verify your repairs. Now, as a technician, you might be saying, well, I'm not getting paid to do this. Well, you are. And that kind of brings me down to these little blurps that I have down at the bottom. And I'll kind of go back over my process and go over these little blurps. Um, I guess I'll start with the seven, the verifying repair. As a technician, you need to justify your times. And this is big. Never go off of just book time. Well, book time says seven hours to replace this. That's all I'm getting paid. No. Whenever you discuss what is wrong with the vehicle, you need to make sure that your service advisor knows that you need time to verify the repair. Whether that's an extra half an hour or an extra hour because you have to do a drive cycle, they should be charging that back to the customer so that way you get paid properly to verify. Because if not, then they're going to look at you as the bad guy. How come you didn't verify it? Well, I didn't verify it because I didn't get paid. Well, that kind of comes back to it's your own fault. Um, Another thing, steps two, three, and four, the verify concern, full health report, and research. All three of those can be interchanged to different uh, numbers in, the, in their process because what happens if, well, how Billy Bob said that he had to drive the vehicle uphill going fast to put a load on the engine for it to hesitate, well, there might only be one hill and it's 15 minutes from your shop. So now you've got to drive 15 minutes out there to try and verify. Before you do that, you could do the full system scan and do any type of research because there might be a TSB for hesitation while under load going uphill. And you can kind of go ahead and figure out how to verify the concern just based off of your research that you had so that way you can be quicker at it and have that better process. So two, three, and four, you can kind of switch them back and forth however you want to better suit whatever that concern is. But do not remove them from the process. The process has to stay in place. This might take you a while to understand, but once you get down that you've got your process and have your process printed out so that way you can follow your steps, it will elevate you as a technician to have a better diagnostic abilities because you're following and you know which way or where you're going at that time as well as it'll give you a better it will give you a better look in the let's say the service advisor's eyes because he knows that you're following your process and you're going to have less chance of comebacks that's huge in our industry so Develop your process and follow your process. Take my process and go off of it and, and adjust it to whatever your needs are. Like I said, my process is kind of broad. And to be honest with you, this process is a little outdated for me now. This was my process in the shop. <clears throat> well, now as a mobile technician where all I do is diagnose the issues, I don't necessarily have the verify repair concern or spot because... Typically, whenever I tell the shop what's going on with the vehicle, 
the vehicle is being repaired later that day or the next day and I can't go back out there and verify the repair. So the verify repair part, it, it wouldn't necessarily fall in line with what I do. But it's still, if you're in a shop, you should be verifying the repair, especially if you're the one doing the repair. So develop your process and get step by step so that way we can start elevating our industry to the level of where we need to be. And the best way to do that is start with processes. So you as a technician, get your processes together and elevate our industry all together as one. So with that being said, I'll, cut, I'll go ahead and kind of fade out on this one, but get your process, get it together and start diagging properly. And always remember, did you diag today, bro? Um, on my website, I'm going to have a link to where you can download my process. Um, and then once you get the process, what it'll also entail is um, I'll be able to do an email back and forth with you so that way we can pinpoint down your process to better suit whatever the career path that you have. So link down below for that and let's build this industry up one technician at a time. Have a good day, everybody.